where it video should be going. This video is the third entry in my Better Old Man's Guide to Haskell video series. This video shall be discussing monads, and we will begin by just describing what a monad is. Starting with the explanation which you're given in category theory, the branch of mathematics where monads originate. I'm using Wikipedia here because Wikipedia is actually a pretty decent source for uh, mathematical stuff. Most of the time, if you have a better choice, then use it for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, according to Wikipedia, in category theory, a branch of mathematics, a monad is an endofunctor together with two natural transformations required to fulfill certain coherence conditions. Now that is a very compressed uh, sentence. There's a lot to unpack there, and most of it is not terribly relevant here. As such, we'll be using two definitions which I've, or explanations which I've also seen. I've seen monads described as being like burritos, which, as weird as that sounds, that actually makes sense. You know, there is the case used in the article where you can't get the stuff out of the burrito, but if you have two burritos, then you can turn them into a ridiculous giant burrito, uh, which is the case in Haskell via the join operation. You can take two monads of the same type and convert them into one thing. No, that's that's not right. You can take two nested monads of the same type and you can just convert it into a monad. You know, it's no longer nested. Alternatively, an explanation which I made, you know, someone might have made it before I did, but I described monads as being like wrappers for things. And for some reason, you can't remove the things from the wrapper, but you can work within the wrapper. Alternatively, you can compare this to the uh, various types of equipment where you, you have the box, and you have the gloves so you can work within the box without opening the box. You could say that box is like a monad because you can put stuff in there and you can add stuff to it. You can, you know, work with the stuff as though it's not in the box, but, uh, you know, it's ultimately still in the box. Alright, now that you hopefully kind of understand what they are, uh, again, hopefully this can be a bit of a hard concept to grasp. Uh, why, why should you care? Uh, the main reason, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into the benefits using monads, you can read up on that, but the reason you want to know what a monad is in Haskell is Haskell, uh, in Haskell all I.O. operations were done by monads, and I know at least on Unix based systems, uh, random functions use the I.O. system, so in Haskell you need to use monads to even do random operations. Now that we know what these are and why I should care, let's go into using them. Alright, uh, I'm gonna make sure that I created a file I wanted to make. Alright, I did.
We told the the roommate to not be terribly loud. Now he's playing train sounds or something. It pissed me off. Jokes on him. I pissed in his coffee. Uh. All right. Here, what I'm doing is, I, I, I've loaded in just a little program which has the run non IO operation in it. I wrote my own version of that, so I don't have to import a, a whole package. And I've also gone and grabbed the control monad package. All right. Let's start with a monad. That, this is a monadic operation of type IO. Alright, that's all well and dandy, but you never really take anything out of this because it's of, you know, empty type. So let's get a case where you do something like that. Let's, uh, read file example.haskell. Alright, that's fine, but... So you see here, can't match type IO string with string. The reason for that is that string is encased in the IO monad and put string line is not designed to take monads as input. So what do we do? We are uh, using the burrito analogy. We so I'm not sure how you'd map the burrito analogy around that. Anyway, let's let's use my uh, glove box analogy. Instead of removing the thing from the box, we can put the function into the box by doing this. See that? It works. And if we check the type, then we'll see that this is type IO nothing. Well, nothing, but no type, or whatever you want to call that. Empty parentheses. Empty type. There we go. Yeah. See here, just as I said. It's a nice change from the last video where I had a few hiccups. Uh, alright. Great. But... What the hell is this thing? Well, if you grew up using C++ like I did, you might think that's a sign right shift. It is not. This is called bind. And this is where we're going to get into using uh, type definitions. So we check the type definition of that function. And you know, you might see that and think to yourself, what the hell is that? I know I did when I first used this stuff, but really this is fairly self-explanatory uh, once you get to understand the type definitions better. This function, called bind, I'm not sure why it's called that, takes as its first input a monad alpha or alpha encased in a monad mic. And as its second input, it takes a function, which takes input of type alpha, and maps that to type bravo encased in monad mic, and it outputs a variable of type bravo encased in monad mic, so you can see. And 
when you consider the types of these functions, that should make some sense. Because I'm going to write this out. Here's what that's doing. You know, it, it looks a bit convoluted, but when when you get to understand this stuff better, my God, this is beautiful. <laughs> uh, it's it, it's very terse, and it describes it well. All right, just to show you that's not a fluke. Uh, Here we take uh, number five, and we encase that in the I.O. monad. And then we add into that uh, box so you can see the plus one function, as well as the print function. And we add one to five, and then we print that. It's... Actually, the box doesn't make sense because ends up often being just kind of transported to another box. Uh, whatever, D don't worry about it, just... concentrate on actually understanding the stuff instead of my stupid analogy. This should uh, print 6 to the console. And it does. And the type should be IO empty. And it is. Alright, great. Now you should understand how to use that function. I recommend playing around with it. We also have this. The nice thing about this is this doesn't confuse the C people. Uh, anyway, what this does is... Sorry, I'm using a different keyboard than I'm used to. Uh, because my other one's pretty loud, I've been meaning to get a quieter one. Or just one that sounds better, maybe one of those nice IBM keyboards. I used to have one of those, but... It was a dumbass and I gave it away or something. Alright. This does exactly what it's supposed to do. And, as you'll see here, These are equivalent. In fact, we can check that by using another command. Actually, Yeah, I, I think I'm right. Lift mic two. Yeah. Yeah, this is a neat one. Uh, what this does is it performs a... Uh, it, it applies a bi-argumental function, which doesn't usually take two monads as the input, and it applies that bi-argumental function 
to the variables which are encased in the monads. Which you can see here. See, here's your function. Here's your first thing encased in a monad. Here's your second thing encased in a monad. And it returns a monadic output. Great function. And one of the really nice things about it. This is really cool. It's not just lift mic 2. It's lift mic true lift mic 5. And they all work the same way. You know, so lift mic just takes a monargumental function. Say plus 1. See? And it should be type IO int or IO integer. Oh yeah, that's right. I forget we have num type. There we go. And now it's doing what I said it would. Oh my god, this is faster than the other videos have been. Great. For some reason I neglected to mention this along with these operators, but we have another uh, group of functions for monads. These They're called a Kleisley composition functions, and this type definition is relatively uh, complex, I guess you'd say. Take here a monargumental function which returns a monad. So two monargumental functions which return monads. And essentially what that does is uh, this becomes a function of this type. Alright, let's try it out. It works. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, this function is mainly used in category theory, but in, in certain cases, this can increase the readability of programs which use monads. Actually, that's all programs, but whatever. <laughs> the technicalities and whatnot. We also have return. This this one's very simple. All the return does is it encases its argument in a monad of your choice. So let's uh. Here's an example. We give it a variable of type string, and we tell it to package it in the IO monad, thereby converting it into an IO string, and it does exactly as I told it. Because Haskell's great. <laughs> See right there. Alright, we 
now have four items knocked off of the list of stuff I wanted to cover. Before I move on to some more functions, I'd like to say that, as I've said before, if you want to know more about this than I discuss, then you have two options. One, you can write that in the comments, I'd be pleased to make a video on it. Or two, which is by far the better option for you. You can read the specification. Hmm. Language report. It's dry, but... If, if you read that, and you understand it, then you will understand the language in far better detail than any video series uh, could let you understand it. I've read through it, and it's a difficult read. You know, it's... It has a lot less humor than I have in my writing. Uh, where... Most of my writing, I'd say, there's a joke in there somewhere. It might not be the funniest thing you've read, but it's... Well, that's kind of weird. Kind of... Eh. Like I... Uh, while we're going to describe some things as being symptoms of happiness. You know, you could say that's a joke. I put that there for the sake of being kind of funny. It's also correct. Uh, but I digress. Let's get back to the point. Some more functions we have are filter monad and map monad. Oh. Now this looks a bit kind of janky, but uh, probably the best way to think about this, the, the easiest way, is if you're familiar with the filter function, which you should be if you watched my previous video. Yeah, it's literally just a monadic uh, version of filter. So you can do, uh... Here's a fairly dumb example, but whatever. Sorry about this. Oh! I see now. You can laugh at me. Feel free to laugh at me if that brings you joy. I'd laugh if I weren't being recorded, such that I'm supposed to be kind of quiet. But, uh... Yeah, I was trying to apply a non-argumental function to two arguments. Uh, that's obviously not going to work. Alright, yeah. Yeah, you can see here that it does exactly what it's supposed to do. 
with my dumb little example. For the love of God, do not write Haskell code like this. Uh, in, in production, this... This is shit. What you should do, in that case, is... These are functionally equivalent. Actually... Alright, what you should do is... That. Yeah, you, you should do this. Because, one, that's less computationally intensive, and two, that's just a hell of a lot more readable and more maintainable. And one of the reasons Haskell was made was creating a maintainable programming language. You know, Please respect that. Oh, sorry. Everything you make will be a lot better for it. Alright. Let's have map monad, which, you know, it's the same idea. It's, an impl it's a monadic implementation of map. I'll give an example. This should be of type uh, num alpha. All right, now it's doing these things just to spite me. Whatever, it has the same meaning. Oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I said that. I really meant that. See, I, I have reasons for preferring writing over speaking. We also have filter monad underscore and map monad underscore uh, now the, the differences between these oh yeah there's no reason to have that function so that doesn't exist Sorry about that, I, I had that in my notes for some reason. <laughs> Remember to proofread before you make these videos, otherwise you might end up looking like a jackass. Alright. We do not have this. Forget about that. You won't forget about it. Make fun of me, but don't think that's a thing. Instead, we have this. And, you know, the differences between these might look to be... Uh, minor. They are not. As you'll see here. See, one of these returns a value. Well, both of them return values because they're functions, but one of them is empty and the other is not. Uh, map monad underscore is used when you don't care about getting a value back. It always returns IO empty. It doesn't always return IO empty, but it returns monad empty. The list of that. Uh, 
And, you know, you, you might think, well, why would I want to just discard that? You know, it's not really any kind of uh, effect on processing. Uh, the reason for that is, I'll make a kind of dumb function here. Alright, we, we print all integers from 1 to 50. And we get this stupid little list of empties. That can potentially just make stuff kind of ugly. So, you know, it's nice to have this as an option. And something you saw me use earlier is this greater than greater than function. You know, here's a case where the type definition doesn't tell you everything it potentially could. Uh, in programming languages like C, this is equivalent to the semicolon. It just says do both of these. So you can put two things in a line. It's sometimes nicer to have that than a bunch of tiny lines. Especially when you want to write uh, a, a one-line monadic function. You can say now this is a badly written program for multiple badly written function for multiple reasons, but it's a fine example of this adequate example of this uh, operator. read before you run stuff, otherwise it might damage something. Thankfully I didn't. You yeah, see so it just prints ass three times, but yeah, it's about equivalent to a semicolon in other languages, but damn train sounds again. Uh, the reason we don't use the semicolon is parse error. You can also just use a semicolon to end a line. But not... But not in the interactive interpreter. You can only do that in compiled... Uh, well, not necessarily compiled, but source files. Non-interactively. Another function we have is the uh, filter. Well, not not filter, sorry. Forever. And you know, let's check the type def. Well, that's useless. <laughs> so I will. I already know what this does. So I uh, take my own advice. I'm gonna check the language report and forever act repeats the action infinitely. Okay, that makes sense. And sure enough, it does. Great. That's often not terribly useful because it can do recursion and whatnot, which I prefer. Uh, in a lot of cases, but you know, there are some cases where uh, 
That can be a bit ugly. It works just fine, but... You know, it, it, it can be prettier. So let's make it prettier. There we go. Absolutely equivalent. I'm guessing you can see what I was trying to do there, but I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. I probably should have written this down before. Alright, let's get out of this crappy interpreter and write some stuff. Yeah, I took a line out of my VimRC file, so... It's going to be throwing some errors, sorry about that. I always like to have this line here. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the other episode, don't worry about it, I'll explain that later. Just did. Now you can worry about it. <laughs> uh. Let's think of some kind of crappy example program. Let's say main equals get args. This returns a list of IO strings, which are the arguments which are passed to the function. I don't believe that the name of the function is included in there. So you know what, we can check. Yeah, the name of the function, or the name of the program is not included. So run that, and it'll print my garbage there. Uh, Alright, let's make a little program which uh, insults the user. I'm making a little piecewise function here to check to see if any arguments have been entered. Uh.
Oh, I see. Here. Right. Yeah, here I'm just going to uh, depend the first input argument to fuck you. And this is getting to be a bit unwieldy. So I'm gonna do this. Just make it a bit more readable. Still kinda sucks. <laughs> Oops, sorry again, I breathe a bit too hard. I know what I need to do. I was really overthinking that. That's a kind of common problem here. One of the reasons I might not want to use this language. think things. That's also good advice outside of Haskell. <laughs> that works. And that works. So, you know, just... It's a dumb program. It's fairly useless. 
it wouldn't make that many people laugh. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe they would at you. If, if you show this to them. Alright. Uh, according to the length of this video, that should be about enough. Uh, you know, just... Keep making your own little programs. Uh, if you've been following along, I haven't gotten many views on these. So, I don't know, maybe I'm just... Giving this talk to an empty auditorium except for like two people. Yay! Uh, which, you know, I, I appreciate those two people, but it's still kind of kind of lame. <laughs> Alright, that about wraps it up. Play with this stuff. Don't stop playing with it. Unless it actively dislike it, in which case, all right, go back to Python or whatever shitty thing you use. Yeah, just make some good stuff. Read the spec. Like I've said, you know, 80 billion times by now. Uh, just keep doing that.